Hello, Spark fans. Welcome back to Advancing Spark, where we're going to get real nerdy today. So, we've done some white paper reviews in the past. We dug into the Lake House paper and the Delta paper from Databricks themselves. We dug into the Polaris paper, which was the deep dive into the internals of how the serverless Synapse SQL engine works. Now, today we have the Photon white paper. Now, a bit of context. A little while ago, Ali Godsey pinged me and said, Hey, there's a new white paper coming. It's called Photon. By the way, it's probably too technical for you. So just to set a bit of a challenge as to where the level is, it's it's fairly nerdy. It's really nerdy. So I'm going to do my best. We're going to take a step through. We're going to have a look at the things that make Photon Photon. Why is it different? Now, we've talked a little bit about that in the past, and I've just brushed over my rough understanding of how it works. But today, we're digging into the white paper, talk about what it is and what were the design decisions that went into Photon to actually get the speed out of it. Why is it faster than traditional Databricks, traditional Spark? What is it that they've actually done? So, that's the plan today. We're going to step through the uh, white paper, pull out a certain few things I've highlighted. It's going to take a little while, so stick with me, and we'll go on this little technical journey. As always with all of this stuff, I do advise that you actually have a look through the white paper yourselves. This is my interpretation. This is how I've read it. Uh, you can always actually probably understand things better than me just by reading the things. So I'll pop the link down in the description, and you can have a bit of, you know, a little, little Sunday morning read of the Photon white paper. I originally tried to read it whilst coming home, really jet-lagged on a long-haul flight. I didn't go so well. Let's stick with it and see how we go. As always, if you're new around here, don't forget to like and subscribe. It's a weird video to start off with, but welcome. We're all friends here. This is a nerdy, sparky place for all of us to come and hang out. Let's crack on with the white paper. So, vote on a fast query for Lakehouse system. It's what we have. Uh, and there's a few bits in here. Obviously, you can see it's written by a million people. All of the uh, Databricks folks in there getting involved and yeah, that's why it's so so nerdy as it is. So, everything's based on the lake house. It's all based on the principle of the lake house. It's all based on the principle of delta. That's like the starting blocks. So those pre two previous white papers, the delta white paper and the lake house white paper, it's good to have that in the back of your mind going into this. Eyes open, they're going to be expecting you to be using delta, and they're expecting you to try and do a lake house. And that's important to understand the kind of queries people are expecting you to try and write. They've designed a system with a certain type of usage in mind, which makes a lot of this stuff make sense. Okay, so yes, they're presenting Photon. It's a vectorized query engine. It has been various different, called various different things as the polymorphic vectorization was the initial way it was put across. And I think I explained that really badly uh, in, in previous videos because I hadn't read this white paper and I didn't quite understand what it was doing. So primarily, vectorization versus code generation is a, what a lot of this white paper is actually about. How do you go about building an engine? Do you build an engine that essentially just writes a load of code and runs it? Or do you build an engine that has a load of pre-built functions and you pass your various query plans to those different functions in a certain order? That's essentially the meat of what we're trying to understand here. So they're setting out to make Spark better for the lake house. The lake house has a load of challenges in there and they're trying to get it better. So there's a lot of this which is just introduction and it's kind of re-explaining the idea of the lake house it's re-explaining what the challenges are so the challenges that they're trying to get which they know from the lake house side is this whole idea of having raw uncurated just this mess of data or very structured very uh tuned very kind of ready to be executed data and it has to be able to do both so there's lots of the traditional database engines a lot of the relational engines they're working in that one. We've got structured data. We built an engine that is insanely fast for that one use case. So the first challenge of Lake House is, well, actually, some of our data is that kind of well-structured data. Some of it is arbitrary, uncurated data, a whole bunch of JSON you've been thrown, a load of text, just some random data in a lake that you're trying to run a query over. And that's a challenge. Um, so challenge number one, it has to be that flexible. It has to be able to deal with data that was actually just full of nulls. It was really sparsely populated. These are things that we see a lot in the lake that actually you might have dealt with already by the time it got to a very, very structured warehouse. So that's one thing. Vectorization gives you runtime and 
flexibility. We'll come on to that about how we actually think about it. But essentially, flexibility. It's the thing that we saw with adaptive query execution when it came into Spark of this whole idea of it going, right, this is my plan. And then realizing the data it read wasn't at all what it planned for. Being able to change that plan is really hard and really important. So that kind of thing. I, the, the, these challenges of lots of nulls or actually it's a certain type of string data, there's a certain type of encoding. There's a certain problem that actually we can, if we could have optimized if we knew about in advance. And that's, that's going to be an issue. Uh, the other one is native, the native language of Photon. That's one of the being the big things we talked about at the start is C++. So it's not Java based. Now, if you know Spark well, that's that's a fairly crazy thing because the entirety of Spark is Java based. But the whole thing works in a JVM. It works inside Java. It's like, oh, by the way, we're just not going to have Java in there anymore. It's like, what? Huh? That? What? But that will come to make sense. So there's lots of things in here kind of explaining why they chose to go the C++ route and how that bakes into this problem. But essentially, they were hitting performance problems. It, it wasn't going fast enough. The things had changed so that actually the way they used to do things didn't quite scale enough. And certainly one of the things I don't quite mention here is part of the whole idea of it being a lake house is a change in the type of query, the type of expectations users have. Uh, if you're running a query on a traditional lake over lots and lots of data, you assume that that's kind of like ad hoc exploration. It's someone digging and trying to find a pattern and all that kind of thing. It doesn't matter if that takes a few minutes or 10 minutes to run because you get used to it. You, you, As a lake user, you expect that. The moment we say this is the lake house, we're saying, well, we're going to put this in front of dashboards, behind dashboards, and we're going to have like a load of business users hammering this thing. That has very different performance expectations. So this suddenly becomes really important. So they were hitting performance bottlenecks. Part of that was the, the point of the JVM engine. And part of that was because they just couldn't get to the memory. They couldn't actually do the things they wanted to do because everything they're doing, they have to write in Java. And then you've got that abstraction layer that is the JVM between what they're writing and the memory. And they couldn't quite get hold of it if they're still writing things that wrote Java. And that comes back to the whole way Spark works. Because Spark is Java based, we don't write code in Java, or we can do, but we, we can write in Scala, which compiles down to Java, sure. But then we can write in Python, we can write in R, we can write in SQL. And as we've seen in a lot of the Databricks stats they put out, it's something like 80, 90% of all Spark usage or all Databricks usage is in either Python or SQL. And neither of those are Java based. And so that's what Spark is doing. It's taking your language, putting it through an engine, and then just spitting out a whole load of Java. And that has not been going fast enough. And that's led to this decision to go, we're going to go C-sharp, uh, C++, C-sharp. <laughs> um, so yeah, we can have a look at that. So that was a challenge that's kind of leading them through some stuff. Second challenge is they can't regress. They've already got a load of Spark APIs. They've already got a load of SQL APIs. There's a load of things that you can currently do. And if you suddenly went, well, actually, none of that, you can't do any of that anymore. You have to start from scratch. The maturity level of their system just massively, massively drops. The flexibility really massive, massively drops. Uh, yeah, they just tie themselves into a corner. So whatever they built had to slot in to the existing way that Spark works. It had to talk really nicely. You do a bit in Photon, pass it back to Spark SQL. Bit in Spark SQL, pass it back to Photon. And that had to work really, really nicely. So they're the two challenges. One has to go faster. I don't know why some of the performance challenges are in that support raw uncurated data. I guess because of the length of strings and some of the things that led to those performance problems. Um, okay, then there's a bit of background and that's doing things like explaining that you've got data lake store, uh, explaining the fact that you've got a delta lake, explaining it you're trying to build a date, you know, a lake house itself. And that's that's all fine. That's kind of good, good context. Um, one thing to note actually in here is where photons actually coming in. I thought I'd highlight it somewhere in here. Um, and that's, we think about, the way we think about performance in Spark, we tend to think about the idea of stages and tasks. We tend to think about where, when things are actually being executed and when things are happening. So if we switch over and we're talking about, you know, a traditional, oh, my whiteboard lost internet. That's what it absolutely needs. So when we talk about what's in a traditional Spark idea, you know, we've got our uh, driver at the top. We've got our two workers, or 10 workers or 600 workers, however many you're actually using. Uh, and we've got a lot of data 
sitting in a lake as an abstracted kind of a separated um, storage layer. Now, when we talk about performance, yeah, I might have four cores on each of those and there's a chunk of work each one has to do. And most of the time we spend thinking about this level, thinking about, well, how much work is there? How many stages are there? How much parallelism? How much shuffle? How much data am I moving between these workers? That's the kind of thing that we're thinking about. When we're saying, where does Photon slot in? It doesn't change our stages necessarily. Like it. it doesn't change the actual the, the steps. It's when there's going to be a task, and that task being, I want to take some particular data, uh, and I want to pull it out, and I want to go and then work with that, then actually that can be saying, well, I'm going to go and do a little bit of Photon here rather than do a little bit of Spark here, or the, the going through the Spark SQL, the, the Catalyst API. So suddenly we're thinking a different, a different grain. And if we do that, if we can pull out at that point and say, well, this bit's going to be Photon, and it's that task that's being executed, well, then the whole of the rest of Spark, the way it parallelizes, the way it spreads work across workers, and all of that stuff stays the same. It's just what the actual task does is different. So that's kind of where we're thinking it fits in. That's when we talk about the whole of this elastic execution layer. All of that is just explaining how Spark works and essentially saying, for Photon, just don't, don't worry, that hasn't changed. It sits inside of there. So again, the Databricks runtime itself hasn't really changed. You've still got a driver node, you're still paralyzing over workers, it's still working, you make a query plan. All it is, is it when it gets to say, right, how do I actually execute that task? What's the work that, that CPU does? That then changes and we can go, right, okay, we've now got a choice. We can pass it to the traditional Spark SQL execution engine or we can pass it to the Photon engine. So it's thinking about it in two different ways. You've still got Spark and the overhead and all that kind of stuff is still there, but we're just changing where it fits in. Okay, so some examples talking through making a SQL query, you know, talking about, again, there's loads of optimizations already, optimizations already in Lakehouse. You think it's like Hilbert clustering, which, you know, might not be familiar to some people. That's also known as Z ordering or Z ordering for the Americans. Um, so essentially when you do an optimized command and you say Z order by these columns, that's actually using a Hilbert space filling curve, or space filling Z curve to decide how it lays out that data. That's all that is, Hilbert clustering or multidimensional clustering. Essentially, there's all these things already baked into Delta that you don't have to worry about. That's, that's already happening. There we go. So to nail that down, Photon runs as a single threaded task in the Databricks runtime. So it's not replacing the parallelism. It's not replacing the drivers and executors and all of how we know the Spark architecture works. It's just saying, this is what happens when we actually try and run some code. Okay. So JVM versus native execution. So that's the, that decision saying, well, actually, they decided to write it in C++. So there's a lot of things that were essentially the, the moving target of where the performance problems were. So working through Java, I mean, that's fine. It kind of helped with lots of disk management, it helped with overall memory management. It is generally doing lots of good stuff. Um, but where the problem is, it changed. So where there's massive, massive IO problems and you just needed scale, it doesn't matter how efficient the box is really, because you can just throw more boxes at it, parallelize out, get over that disk IO problem. That's what Spark has historically been great at. But now we're saying, well, actually, that's not really the problem anymore. We've optimized so much through these things, such as like, you know, the local SSD caching that Delta Cache Acceleration does, uh, the optimized shuffles and the, the kind of uh, low shuffle merges, all those things, the data clustering, the kind of Z ordering that we've talked about. All those things are just different techniques to massively reduce the amount of data that we need to read or when we do read it, make sure we actually keep it locally cached. We don't have to go back to it. So lots of things that we've done say, well, actually, IO is no longer really the bottleneck in a lot of what we're doing. It's not a disk problem. It tends to be a CPU or memory problem. So suddenly we're actually now looking going, oh, no, we need these boxes to be faster. The way we actually process data could be a lot faster, could be a lot more efficient. And we're now hit, we're now sped things up to the point where we're hitting those bottlenecks. So the, the point of performance optimization has changed to now be a CPU memory problem. Makes sense? So yeah, what do we do about it? So on C++ is, it is a native, uh, a natively executed bit of code. So we can just actually have real fine tuned control over what we send to the CPU, what we're sending to the memory, how we're actually managing the 
close coordination and that. And you don't get that if you're going through a JVM. You're kind of you're going through this virtualization layer. So saying we want to use C++ makes absolute sense. Um, but there's a few bits in there that didn't make any sense for me whatsoever. When I was first told this, so historically, when we're talking about some performance problems that you've got in Spark, if you talk about doing a Python UDF, so that's when saying, I'm going to write my own custom user-defined function, and I'm going to, I'm going to save that, I'm going to pass it to my users. And we saw they just don't perform well. And that's because the Python cannot execute natively inside a JVM. It has to pass it out. So there's whole interrupts, and we've got vectorized pandas UDFs and all that kind of stuff to try and make it faster, but it's still just never as fast as running it inside Spark. And I was really confused when I was first going into this, going, well, isn't it isn't that what we're going to see here if we switch to use C++? And we'll come on to actually how we can get around it. But once the data is over there, once the data is in a native execution language, then yes, we can write things up much faster, much more kind of, uh, we get much more close control. Yeah, you could write terrible things in there as well, but you can write massively, massively, massively optimized little kernels of functionality. So they made that decision. So rather than have to build increasingly complex, increasingly hard workarounds inside Java with people who are absolute experts of Java uh, JVM internals, they actually went, well, could you not do that? And write it in something that's super native and we get absolute full control with C++ and then figure out how to get the data over. That was what was in my head. But yeah, that's fine. So they made that choice. They made rather than the increasingly diminishing returns you get from working inside JVMs, they're going to go the C++ route. The next choice is a fundamental shift in terms of how uh, how Spark actually works. So with Spark, we've got that thing called the Catalyst Engine. Now that is the, the SQL execution engine, the thing that can take Python or SQL or Scala or R, do a load of stuff, make a plan, make a costed plan, decide what it's going to do. And then at the end of that whole process, the engine just basically writes a load of code. It's a code generator. It goes, right, okay, to do all these things, we just need to write all this code. And it's got loads of efficiencies and things baked into it. But essentially, that's, that's what it's doing. It's writing code for us. And they've decided to go, actually, we don't want to do that. We won't, don't want to use code generation. Instead, what we're going to do is build a set load of little simple functions and use those functions. So it's essentially built, uh, calling a list of pre-built functions in a specific order, designed the specific order, instead of generating the code itself. And that's where the vectorization stuff comes into it. Now, one of the things I'm looking through this, that SIMD, so SIMD vectorization, is one of the things that um, Reynolds Zinn, when he was doing a keynote about this, uh, maybe even two years ago, uh, that was when he was first talking about Photon, threw out this picture of passing multiple different values to the CPU as a single client thing. Now, that in this context isn't vectorization. That is what's this, this SIMD, that's single instruction, multiple data. Suddenly being able to just do, well, actually just do that as a single CPU pass much, much faster. So SIMD vectorization is something that we can actually build a little simple function saying, ah, yeah, pass all that to the CPU once, bring it back. So it's a type of optimization that we can build, but that happens inside a given vector or in, inside one of our given kernels that we pass a vector into. We'll come on to that stuff. So essentially they made that decision. And they talk about that kind of going back and forwards a little. Um, there's the whole reasoning as to why we went that particular way. So developing it. And I, I, I completely get I guess, this argument, right? For your developers, if you have a code generator and then you're saying, right, can we just test it? Can we unit test it? Can we test that particular thing? And you, you've got something that just produces code. Well, to get it to, to test it, you need to put something in, produce the code and then test the code. And so you end up kind of just abstracted away from what's actually happening and a trick it into generating the code that you want to test so you can then test it and as they mentioned they were having to manually inject like little debugging issues little kind of just like putting ink in there so you can trace through where it actually went uh was actually if you're just building out these little vectors you're building out these little kernels and saying hey i've got a, a little pre-built function we just tested this function if i pass it there it passes that out a really known tried and tested way of developing so essentially if they move away from code generation it's just easier to test therefore they can move faster they can build it quicker As to say from two months to prototype aggregations with a code generating engine a couple of weeks with a vectorized engine because they can move that much faster because they can test it quicker and the code simpler again observability yeah you can really see what's happening if it says right 
we're going to run this quite gnarly query. And then on one side, you just have this gigantic bit of code generation that doesn't have to look pretty, doesn't have to be explainable because it's just, it's generated code, generated on the fly. On the other side, you just have these sets of predefined, designed functions that are built, tested, observed. So you can well actually, how many times do we call this particular function? How long does it spend in that function compared to that function compared to that function? If you're breaking up your query into, into these all of these different functions, then that's really easy to see what happened inside that query. Whereas if you've just got a gigantic pile of code that's been generated, it spent all of its time in my giant pile of code, and you don't get that breakdown. Now, there's other sides of that. In terms of the code generator, it can be really smart. Go, well, you're about to do that and that and that. Well, I'll just do all that as a single step. And that's some of the optimizations that's in the code generation approach that we're losing now. We're not going to get some of those efficiencies are going to go away. But the argument made in this paper is actually, well, yeah, but we get other efficiencies that more than make up for it. So there's always a, to get something, you lose something. To get something else, you lose something. But hopefully it all works out in the end. Okay, so other bits and pieces. Uh, yeah, easier to adapt to changing data. Now, again, we mentioned that in terms of that AQE side of things. We can actually, if we have a particular vector that brings back certain data, we look at that and go, oh, that's a different shape. We can actually, rather than, because we haven't regenerated a whole load of code, we can go, well, actually, well, let's do, call that thing first and then call those other functions afterwards, rather than going and just sticking bluntly through my giant pile of code which it makes sense. Um, I mean, the other argument is if you're using a code compiler and you start it, you realize it's different. And then you you can just re recompile, make a new plan, generate a whole load of new code. But each time you do that, that's overhead. And if we're talking about trying to get it really, 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 really fast, we're going to dashboard uses. That's, that's not great. So it makes sense. You can be a little bit more dynamic because you're just calling these pre-built things. You're not having to compile things on the fly or write code on the fly. Uh, other things I've done, so because they're planning out particular uh, vectors, they can they can build a thing called, they, they refer to a specialization. So that's saying if there's a particular query that someone wrote that always went slow when it was code compiled because it's a particular thing that happened, maybe, you know, what we're saying in terms of a particular type of string encoding or a certain type of sparse nullable data in there. In this case, where people are talking about, well, having, you know, kind of between left and right is actually the same thing if you just write it as between, and it's all kind of the same. Um, and they say, well, actually, what we can do if we're, if we're do building these pre-built little functions, we can be really specific. We can make a specialized function going, well, if this scenario happens, do it this way, and we can build a bit of optimized code that handles that very specific operation. So whilst that adds complexity in that they have to have more of these different ones, each type of specialization has to have a separate different function of the kernel, that's fine, because it means they can build out optimizations and they can handle these things. Okay, so big, big arguments as to code generation versus uh, vectorization, but makes sense. Uh, other bits. One thing I hadn't really thought about, to be honest, but whenever uh, Spark SQL, whenever Spark deals with data, it essentially kind of pulls out something from that is intrinsically row oriented, Parquet, and it does a pivot. It turns it into row based data when it's stored as RDDs in the uh, in the Spark memory. So when you have your different chunks of memory held across your workers, that is stored as a row-based um, solution, which kind of makes sense for some of the arguments that it's doing. Uh, what they're saying with Photon, they decided to not do that. They decided to keep it as column store. And that has all the benefits of column store. So when you are doing things, you know, you can have column selectivity. Uh, you get all the good compression that you get from column store. Uh, you've got loads of just there's a reason why we use parquet right because it's a really 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 good way to store data for analytics so does it that way so it's got a different way of storing data when it's being used for a step of photon and that's not the same when we're talking about the caching not the same when we're talking about um other things that might be in between in, in terms of the shuffle steps between stages of a spark query but when it's actually just holding data for while it's working on it when it's using the processing side of the spark memory if it's in Photon, it's going to be storing it as common store, which is, again, just a different switch, just a, a chance for them to kind of relook at some of the uh, some of the engineering choices made with the original Spark engine and go, you know what, we're going to do it slightly differently, which makes sense. Now, we'll come on to some of the things. It's going to have to turn it back to row to pass it back out. And there's some compatibility things we'll talk about there. 
but generally that's how it's working inside a photon, which is another reason why it might go faster in certain circumstances. Um, and then some considerations about how they rolled it out. So we've seen photon in there for ages. Um, and we've seen the photon isn't always called. So what they want to do is rather than have to say, right, there's a thing called photon. You'll see it in three, five, ten years when it's finished and everything in Spark can run on photon. They didn't want to do that. They wanted to say as soon as we possibly can, people can start benefiting from photon. And that means that they wanted to get out when lots of things wouldn't run on photon. So we saw it first. They said, right, here's the photon engine. It'll only work for certain queries. And if you ran a query and you used certain commands, certain kind of SQL functions in there, you'd look at the execution plan and it went, right, 80% of this query ran in Photon. You're like, yeah, that's, that's good. And then you add a different function and it goes 0% of it ran in Photon, which is I had to pull the whole thing out because what that function wasn't Photon compatible. And that's simply those little specialized like so, uh, vectors, the, 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 the functions that they're writing in C++ hadn't been built yet. So it didn't have a way to process that data if that step was in the plan. Therefore, it all fell out of Photon. But that was the partial roller. That meant that they could actually push it out and it wouldn't interrupt people. It wouldn't say, no, this doesn't work for you. It just means certain steps wouldn't be passed to the Photon Engine, therefore wouldn't go faster. But it meant they could get it out quick and then start iterating and improving and adding in more and more and more and more and more and more of these little bits of functionality. It's pretty cool. Okay, so they were the main design decisions. So they've gone through and said, okay, we're going to, one, we're going to make it native, not JVM. We're going to use C++, which makes sense. Two, we're going to use vectorization rather than code gen. Okay. Three, column store, not row. And four, they were happy that the engine wasn't complete. That it's going to be, actually, we're going to get, we're going to get a percentage of coverage and we're going to improve on that rather than holding it back. That's kind of the initial thrust behind kind of what they're trying to do. So a little bit of, a little bit more digging. Let's go deeper into what actually happens when they, they actually call this execution engine. What is this vectorized execution? So we've said that we're actually now using column store. So the, the unit of data that we can actually perform an action on has changed because we're now looking at columns, not just rows. So whereas it used to be, okay, we're dealing with a thousand rows or hundred rows, whatever chunk of data we happen to be doing a pass on, that used to be, okay, we're dealing with all of this stuff. Can we take it away. If we're dealing with it in columns, well, actually, we can say, well, actually, well, 100 rows, sure, but 100 values for this column. It's a much more selective set of data we can deal with. And then we can actually go, well, so we've got that vector. So we're saying a column vector is all the values for a particular column within a particular subset. And then actually, if we say, well, and then all the different columns that I'm currently looking at, all of that together is a column batch. Similar to what we call a row group if we're talking about parquet, you've got your various different column segments, and then you've got your row group that contains a set of column segments for so many rows. And that's what this is trying to say at the top. So we've got this one column vector, which is just the three values or the two values and the null that we've got for one, uh, one of my columns. And then they also have this nullability. So there's another thing that's attached to it. Every row has a nullability going, is this thing going to be null? Is this thing null? Is this thing null? And that allows them to do things. Are there any nulls present here? If there aren't any nulls, go down a really super optimized way. If there are nulls, okay, we'll go a less optimized one because we have to have a switch saying, is this, opt is this null, is this not null? Things like that they can do by just isolating the data and treating it in a certain way. Uh, we also have this idea of a position list. So that's basically against all the values I've got in my particular uh, column vector going, well, just a base index of, well, that's that's value zero, that's value 120, that's value 10, whatever that happens to be. Um, again, just a rolling list of what we're dealing with for our data. So there's a few different ideas of what we've got going on behind the scenes, some differences in the structure of what it's actually doing to the data when we work with it. So essentially, when we then decide to do a pass, change a value, or filter some data, or do something to some data, we can do it at that level. So when we talk about this thing called a vector, so we're saying we're going to pass into our, we're going to pass an operation through, then we can actually pass it to one of the kernels written directly in C++. So we can pass into that C++, hey, here's my column vector, my list of values for this particular column. Here's my nullability information about it. And then here's my position list. Here's my index of which values we want to be looking at. We pass that in. And then it passes the same thing back out. 
And that means, you know, talk about testability, talk about observability, because it is that blunt of, it's a function. Like a, like a, almost like a microservice, right? It's microservice, but way down at the actual kind of uh, tin levels. They call it a nanoservice. That makes more sense than, you know, vectorized execution. <laughs> but it's doing that kind of thing. That's the pin. Bring it back. That's that vector to the next operator. Bring it back. That's the thing to the next operator. Bring it back. And essentially have that rolling thing of this list of vectors being passed into these different operators. Which is interesting. That all makes sense. So we've then got some information about how they've done it for different types of operator. So as our generally, yes, we've got these vectorized execution kernels, which could be lots of different operations. I think they've got an example for a square root operation in, in a moment. But you got things like filters. So a filter is interesting because rather than actually changing the, the vector of data, rather than going in and modifying that column store um, segment in my parts, uh, actually you can just can edit the position list. I'll actually just take these things out of the index or mark them as inactive in my position list. Therefore, we don't need to go back onto them. So it has this idea of keeping the data the same, but just flagging which bits of data we actually want to use at any one state. It's going to make things a lot faster than having to open up and change it. Which makes a lot of sense. Uh, but then certain other optimizations, such as they mentioned, they're kind of uh, the single instruction multiple data uh, execution. It's disallowed because you can't pass in active rows into it. But there's decisions have made it there. Now again, how much of this do you actually need to know? I'm guessing not very much, but it's interesting. <laughs> They've got interest about how the vectorized hash table works. So eventually, if you're doing a, a join between different data sets, you need to kind of get together, it'll generate a hash table. Um, and then how that actually works in a vectorized way, and then actually with the position list of inactives to the vectorized, and then looking at uh, how you have to get out, that essentially they've built those operations into those kernels to actually say, well, this is how we join between these things uh, in, in, a, in a fast way. Okay. Other bits and pieces. Uh, they talk about memory management. So, and that's always going to be interesting when you're talking about something like a VM and it has to actually just work well with there. You know, what you can't have is if Photon was going away and doing something in memory and then Spark, because it wasn't aware of Photon, was like, oh, I'm out of memory. I'm just going to wrap that piece that the operating system's using. It probably doesn't need that. And then suddenly Photon's got no memory left. Uh, that, that has to be uh, catered for. So essentially it has its own idea of how it's using memory, uh, how it's allocated memory and kind of of the memory available to photon, which bits it's using it at once, that has to be a consideration because it's still all in memory. So it has to be held that way. Got an example of a, uh, a low down C++ kernel, if you're interested, all cool. But essentially, yes, there is an external memory manager that goes and looks after that. Okay, adaptive. So we talk about this is getting lower and lower. So going deeper and deeper into how it actually looks at that. Essentially, all you really need to know, there's a few different examples of how they're building in optimizations. So, and that's, it's an important thing to know about why two queries would run and just be entirely different in terms of the performance. So if there's any nulls in the batch versus uh, any inactive rows, so inactive rows being where that position list has been edited and said, well, we're not using these because we've had a filter. So filtering out data in some cases will make it go a different route in terms of the those kernels it'll pick, those functions down at the low level it'll choose to run It'll pick a different one if you've already filtered some data out. It'll pick a different one if there's any nulls in your data. Another thing is, you know, if you've got, uh, if you're talking about some strings, if they're all ASCII encoded, it can go a really, really quick way. Whereas if they're all UTFA, it might have to go a slightly different way. So just the, the nuance of the data, because they can build these really, really low level optimizations, is going to change just based on the makeup of the data that's inside there. It may choose to go an entirely different route in terms of how it processes it. And that level of detail is something that we, we barely we barely ever get anywhere close in terms of how the, the Spark SQL engine works because it's just generated code. We don't even think about that. I think I want to talk about how it actually plugs into stuff. And essentially, it's just saying it's a switch. So where it might say, okay, so the steps, the query steps you're going to go through for this query is going to be, well, grab the object and then shuffle it, do a filter, and then, well, actually the other way around, read the data, do a filter, shuffle it, and then pass it back. Now it's going to go, well, actually, just hot swap Photon in here. So from the data that we grabbed, pass it over to Photon, filter it, shuffle it, and then pass it back. Essentially, it's just slotting into one of the steps that we might have in an existing query. Which, again, makes, makes entire sense. Um, so a lot of this is about that. It's about how it fits in. And the interesting, for zero copy, 
since the scan produces columnar data. And I was like, still at this point, really slightly confused, going, but how does that work? Because we're outside the JVM. Because we use writing C++. That, that to me, I'm not a Java guy, which is why all of this stuff didn't make it like that much sense. So there's two things. One, when you do a file scan uh, using uh, Spark, I mean, the data that we're reading, if we're reading Parquet data, that comes in as columnar data. And normally, it has to then switch that round to turn it into rows. So if the point we're passing it into Photon is before it's switched it over into row-based data, that's great. We don't have to do... We can just take that data and run using that data as it is. We don't have to take a copy of the row-based data and turn it back into column store so we can use it because we're pointing in. It's basically an adapter at the point of we do the file scan. We can actually just go and use that directly. So number one, great. We're not having to switch back from rows into columns because we can go right at the start before it's changed it into row-based data. Now, this is the other bit that actually so I had to dig into. So Photon runs in the JVM process. Number one, aha, cool. We're not in an interrupt. We're not running outside of JVM and having to take chunks of data, throw it outside of JVM, execute it in C++. We're running it inside of the JVM itself. That's because it's using the JNI, that's the Java native thing, which I've now forgotten what that stands for. JNI is the Java native, native interface, of course. Mm. Essentially, what that allows you to do is you can actually run compiled tasks against the machine itself you, inside a JVM if it's using something that, like C++ that can actually be run natively. That means, unlike when we're using things like uh, Python and R and UDS and all those kind of things, which can't run natively, because this can run via this JNI, this kind of exchange uh, where we can run direct compiled kernels against the machine itself, then we no longer have to move data back and forth. So if we have scanned some data and we pulled it in as columns, those columns are immediately accessible to the Photon engine itself via C++, rather than having to pick it up and move it somewhere else for Photon to process that data. That for me was like a, ah, okay, now I get why it's so fast. Because it's a way of essentially flipping through the JVM being able to run this data directly against the CPU and memory of the machine itself, whilst still not having to move the data anywhere. We don't have to use an interrupt. So, cool. Okay, that makes sense. So Photo can read data that Spark can see. Photo can shuffle, shuffle data and have it available back to Spark. And that means why we have an execution plan that is a little bit of Spark, step out, do a load of Photon, step back, do a load of Spark. We're not talking about moving data back and forth to be able to do that. Hence. It's zero copy. And that for me was a big, yeah, cool. Okay. And now I now see why it's uh, a lot faster. So again, it can just provide pointers and go, oh, it's, it's over there. The data's there. You can see it already. It's in memory that you can already see. Uh, there is a final point. So when Photon's done, so if we say, yeah, Photon managed to get this data that was already in column, not columnar format, and then press it against a load of these kind of uh, operator kernels and kind of to do a load of uh, work, at the end, it does have to put it back into row store so that it can then just be picked up by the rest of uh, Spark SQL. Because I think if there was a, a load of different stages being executed and some of those stages were photon compatible and some of them weren't, essentially at the end of each of those stages, it has to be in a state where the next step could be either photon or, um, or a Spark SQL uh, stage. So it has to put it back into the state that Spark SQL would have had it in so that it can just slot neatly in. Now, at some point, they might fix that. I think they mentioned kind of uh, that it is going to be a future plan to see about, mm, maybe we won't do that. But for now, when Photon's plugged in and Photon is an optional thing that's kind of, you know, slipping in and augmenting the existing Spark SQL engine makes entire sense. That kind of just fits in. Okay, other bits, memory management. Essentially, this is just a little bit more detail of going, well, the Spark engine can go, right, okay, well, we need this amount of data. We're going to make a, a reservation of memory for Photon to deal with. And just does like a little carves out a section of the, uh, the JVM memory and go, right, that's, we're not touching that. And then Photon can allocate data into it and deallocate and allocate and deallocate, all using that reservation. Essentially just stopping us from Spark from just stealing the memory and moving out. Now, you can do things wrong. You can spill things out. It's going to be doing that. But it's making sure it's safe. It's making sure it's not going to cause a memory overload and out of memory exception. And it's because we have this memory manager inside of Spark that can look after that, we're a little bit more protected.
Okay, other bits. Um, I mean, cleaning up the data. So it needs to have its own garbage collector. It's going to have some things because it's not running under the whole Spark thing. It's going to be able to remove those reservations and clean up anything it's left in memory. Got those things plugged in. Just makes sense. Okay, I know there's a bit of a blitz through a load of technical uh, wizardry that they've done. And I've probably done an absolute disservice uh, by whipping through it so quickly. And I've probably fudged some of the explanations. But to me, that makes sense. It makes sense that they've basically just written a load of functions way down at the uh, the C++ level. They can pass data into it without copying it over. And they can just at runtime go, right, instead of having this giant load of code, these are the operations we're going to call. And they're pre-compiled and they're very, very heavily specialistly optimized for certain tasks. Makes makes sense to me. They then talk a little bit about how they, how they plug it in. So doing unit tests from how they make sure it all works. I was laughing when they said they do fuzz tests with a load of surgical fuzzes. Essentially, a load of query generators and a load of different benchmarks to say, is this going to run the same? Is there a chance if you run a query and it runs in Spark and you run a query and it runs in Photon, if they're going to give different answers, that is not cool. We cannot do that. That is not allowed. We have to make sure these things are absolutely consistent regardless of which of the two different engines you're using. So they talk about how they tested it, how they made sure it's consistent, how they make sure it fits together. Okay. Which queries will Photon benefit? So based on what we've seen, it's Photon benefit anything where they have already written one of these specific optimization kernels, where there is a vector available and to go and actually sort of work that way. So joins, aggregations, SQL expressions, provided they have already um, written that SQL expression in. One of the examples that is now fixed, one of the examples we used to have is if you used one of the the more nuanced um, window functions. If you'd like collect list or collect set, then there wasn't a photon kernel for that. It didn't know how to do it. So you can have a SQL query that's all happy and that would all run in photon. Then you add another column into that select statement that's doing a collect list. And then suddenly none of it would work in photon. So provided the SQL expression is already covered by the functionality inside photon, then joins, aggregation, and SQL expression are all going to be optimized. They're all the kind of things that go faster. Things that aren't going to go faster it's the things that are currently disk bound. So if you look at when you go into uh, Databricks SQL and you run a query and you get that little breakdown of, well, this is how much time was spent reading the data from disk. This is how much time was spent running the query. This is time, how much time was spent rendering and showing you the query. If all of your time is in the executing, that's all usually the good stuff that the photon can really, really squeeze down. If all of your time is just in the sheer read, we're just reading a ton of, ton of, ton of data and it's all about disk access. Well, Photon's not going to change that. We're still using the Spark file scan. That is no different. So depends on the kind of bottleneck that you are seeing in your queries. But if your kind of queries are hitting execution bottlenecks, and it's execution bottlenecks that we're talking about, joins, aggregations, and SQL expressions, which is most of them, then that is what Photon's for. And hopefully that all now makes sense because you're thinking about how they've implemented. You think about what's actually in there that's going to gonna make it faster. Then, because it's a white paper, we've got all the proof in the pudding. A very English statement. <laughs> they have the proof. They have the experiments, they've done the benchmarks, they've done all the various things that they've put in there to try and say, how fast is it? So you can go through that and just see the various different ways they've turned it on, they've suddenly seen it go a lot faster. Generally, a smaller runtime is better because it's running for less time, it's faster. We like fast. Smaller number is good. So doing hash joins, I said it's better. Doing just an arbitrary SQL expression of an upper is, is better looking at different sizes of data, it's generally better. Um, and all of this is comparing against itself. So it's not trying to do some compete. It's not going to say, hey, look, this is what Snowflake's doing. This is what Synapse is doing. This is what Redshift is doing. It's just saying, look, compared against Databricks itself, this is how it goes when you turn the photon engine on. So it's definitely interesting seeing it just get faster and faster and faster. Um, so yeah, I kind of skipped over a lot of that. One of the things I didn't really think about is actually the right optimization for writing the data. So when writing the data out, I was like, well, that's a disk I.O. thing, right? That's not going to be made faster by turning Photon on. Um, but the bits they're talking about here is actually going, well, because they can actually write optimizations, they can have optimizations for dictionary encoding, one of the things that goes inside a parquet file. Uh, they can use the optimized bit packing, the, all these statistics when it goes into the delta table and it has all the min, max, and all that kind of stuff. They are all data queries it has to run um, on the data before it puts out. 
So actually, yeah, there's things it can do when you're writing out. So the read wouldn't be particularly um, sped up, but you're right. Actually, you might find is sped up if you're writing lots of large parquet files. That could be an option to see about writing it out. But there's other bits such as compressing and writing that's there's no there's no difference. They, they do the same. So yeah, always interesting to have a look what's in there. I kind of skipped over the rest of it. So interesting when they're talking about so related things. I mean, so because it's a white paper, they're admitting, they're saying, well, we've not, we've not invented this stuff. They're not the first people to have done a vectorized um, query engine. They're not the first people who have written a, a code base, a code generating query engine back in the original Spark days. So they are happily saying that this is this is built on the collective work of the industry. You know, that kind of MonoDB and X100 have done a lot previously with the vectorized execution model. But again, you see plenty of things in C-Store, Vertica, Snowflake, have actually been doing these things to prove that it can actually work. Um, and it's interesting that they talk about whilst Photon is a pure uh, vectorized execution engine, uh, they, they do consider hybrid approaches something they might do in the future. So currently, if there's something that's really, really complex, and to do that in vectors would actually be running loads and loads of different vectors, and actually the old code gen approach just would have actually just blatted out some code to do that. You know, well, maybe, maybe that makes sense to do in the future. Maybe, maybe that's something they, they could do where it's vectors, vectors, vectors. Oh, that's complex. Generate some code and just squeeze that in as a custom vector in the middle of everything else. So interesting ideas that are, are baked into it. And yeah, that's that's the white paper. And I realize that is... Oh, we've been going on for a long time there. Um, there's a ton of information in there. Now, again, message being, it goes faster because they've built a more optimized engine, because they've got access to the low-level memory and CPU, and so they can do some really smart stuff. The single instruction, multiple data is a massive thing, but just speeding up how it works through stuff. Being able to just manage its own stuff and actually prepare for a load of really common query types just gives them the ability to massively specialize and massively optimize for what people are doing. But if you write a query that they haven't preempted, that they haven't assumed that someone's going to write, Maybe there won't be an optimization there yet, which is why it might drop out of Photon. That's why you'll see this idea of, is my query going to be good in Photon? Well, run it. See what the see what it says. How long does it spend inside the Photon engine? And then you get this idea of how fast it's going to go. Now again, apologies to all of the authors of this paper for the awful job I've done of butchering various different bits of Java memory management and what it's actually doing down at the uh, the lower level. But hopefully that helps people kind of understand what it's doing. And people, people give people an idea of how this stuff all just fits together, what the point was, why it's different, why it's such a drastic move away. And again, that for me, it's helped me kind of really clarify, one, the fact that we're not making copies of data and therefore why it's not going to go drastically slower. Uh, <laughs> but also too, actually what we mean when we talk about vectorization, what we talk about when we think about the optimizations that are put in there, how they've managed to incrementally roll this thing out. It's super interesting. There's loads of stuff in there. So uh, again, I'll put a link down to the white paper if you want to have a read through it yourself. I do recommend you actually read it yourself rather than take my interpretation. Um, but otherwise, yeah, if you're not already using Photon, it is now GA. So you can turn on, it's automatically turned on when you go into Databricks SQL. And Databricks SQL on that kind of that dashboarding side just assumes you're writing the kind of queries that's really going to benefit from that. But you can turn it on in your data engineering uh, clusters. You can use it in your data science clusters. Uh, not with ML title. You can use it for lots of different things, but just have a think. Am I writing the kind of query where these optimizations have been built, therefore it's going to uh, use Photon, which is going to be more expensive. The Photon engine costs more. And if you're not, you don't need to use it. If you are, absolutely switch it on, do some trials, make sure it's actually hitting the Photon engine in your execution plans, and you'll see a massive, massive benefit from it. Yeah, right. I'm going to go and sleep. Whew, cool. Thanks for staying with me. And if it's your first time around, don't forget to like and subscribe. And I'll see you next time for a slightly less nerdy video. <laughs> Cheers.